Hello and welcome to the Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex Rue of Big Ten Network, and this week's guests are former Minnesota and Chicago Bears, defensive back and safety, Brock Vereen, and Big Ten Network manager of research, Harold Shelton. Let's get into it. Take a look, listen, and enjoy. Look at here, look at here. With the catch, the finish! Oh, my All right, before we get to Brock Vereen, quick word from our sponsor, Northwestern University School of Professional Studies. You can build a solid foundation in strategic, creative, and analytic skills that are essential for success in the business of sports in the master's program in sports administration at Northwestern University. Find out more at sps.northwestern.edu slash sports. Definitely a great opportunity there. Check it out if you're interested in working in sports, working at a place like Big Ten Network, that master's program in sports administration at Northwestern up the road in Evanston. It's a great option. So thanks to them as always. All right. Now we'll get to our first guest, Brock Vereen. Brock, as we'll get into here, is a up and coming sports media figure. He has worked at Big Ten Network now for a couple of months. He is a uh, host on our Big Ten Network tailgate show, travels around the conference and does its pregame show every Saturday. Played for Minnesota, an all-Big Ten player there on defense uh, in the secondary, and had a couple years in the NFL as well. Uh, I, re- I remember him especially for the Chicago Bears uh, when he was drafted by them and, and played about a season and a half for the Bears. So talk about his football career, but also talk about his, uh, his venture into the media career and how he got his start and how he's enjoyed it so far, getting into a bunch of Big Ten campuses and talk about some of his favorites as well. So really good discussion with Brock coming up, and we'll get right to it. It's a Take 10 podcast discussion with Brock Vereen. All right, I'm very pleased to be joined by Brock Vereen. He's a former star defensive back for the Minnesota Golden Gophers, played for the Chicago Bears, now works with us here at Big Ten Network. And you can follow I, him. I don't, I, I don't know about star, maybe like, like a moon. Hey, all Big Ten is star in my book. You can't, you can't already start selling yourself short, man. So what's good with you? How, how are you doing? Thanks for jumping on bright and early out there on the West Coast. Of course, man. Thanks for having me. Cannot complain about a single thing. Uh, get to go to cool college campuses and talk about football. There are a lot worse things to be doing on the weekend. Yeah, no doubt. And when I heard you were joining our team here at, at the network, you know, I was excited as a Bears fan, I do remember you, okay. and uh, that was back in my college days, though. So it's been a while, <laughs> yeah. um, even though it doesn't seem like that long ago. So, so fill us in on what you've been up to and how you kind of made your way into the sports media space. How you found yourself yeah. at Big Ten Network? Yeah. So when the playing days were over, um, the first thing I did was cover high school football uh, for Fox sports, their West coast prep zone team, um, in, in Southern California. So we had from orange County up to Santa Barbara. And, and as as anyone who follows college football knows, there's a lot of talent in, in California. So it was, it was a cool opportunity to, uh, one, get the experience to get the experience with really good football being played and a lot of eyeballs on it, you know, typically, you know, a high school game could draw a couple dozen views maybe on a good day but when you have dj uyunglele playing jt daniels in the cif championship you know what i mean like it, it it brought a different kind of stage so that was the the perfect foray into it from as far as i was because you got people from south carolina watching it you got people from us you got usc fans watching it of course and that was the the first big step. Uh, did a lot of things with a company called Campus Lore, still doing things with them. A lot of interview stuff, which is awesome, interviewing NFL guys about the college experience pre-NIL days. You kind of had to be in the NFL in order to uh, do anything college football related. Um, thankfully, that that's, that that's dead and gone now. And here we are four years into this thing and could not be at a better place. Of course, the Big Ten is near and dear to me. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even someone in the Midwest knows about modern day and, and the high school yeah. powerhouses out in Southern California. Yeah. Uh, saw you on Twitter. I believe it was a clip on CBS Sports Network. I also saw yeah. 
you have uh, a venture called ESTV. So you have some other ventures going on. Can you can you fill us in about that and uh, how you're kind of spreading your your portfolio out here? Yeah, man, football season is chaotic. It really is. It's kind of a uh, sleep on planes for these next 15 to 17 weeks. But then when football season is not going on, you get to hang out and do what you want. So, yeah, so CBS Sports Network, I was on uh, that other pregame show, or Tops, as, as it's called around the building. Uh, this will be my second week coming up in a three-week stretch, so be sure to check it out. It, it is an absolute blast, man. And, again, it, it's such a surreal thing to be at Purdue in front of an awesome audience, get on that plane, go to New York, get to talk about the NFL, and then come home and start getting prepared for Maryland, which is where we're headed this week, uh, ESTV is something that we started two and a half years ago. Uh, myself, my brother, Amon Green, um, and Eric Yoon, who is the CEO and founder. It is an esports television network available on all the OTT, meaning non traditional cable platforms Samsung TV Plus, Sling TV, Vizio, Roku. Of course, if you have Roku, you can find it both as an app and as a live channel. Uh, it has been an absolute blast, man. We, we have been growing like crazy. Uh, as, as anyone who follows any kind of digital media or sports knows, esports is, quote unquote, the next big thing uh, we, we like to see as it, it's already here. Uh, when you got 16 year olds making $3 million in Fortnite tournaments, it, it, it's hard to say it's next up, you know. Uh, it, it, it has been great. We have a huge focus on the college esports scene, too. We have over 300 colleges who give us rights to show their stuff and we firmly believe that that is the next tool in growing uh the college scene right the same way that a kid might a, a non-athlete might go to a certain school because he is a football fan or a basketball fan and yeah i could go here or i could go to duke they're both rated the same as far as what i want to study i'm gonna go to duke because i'm a basketball fan right that's the thing that happens uh it, we're starting to see that with esports. People are going to Mizzou and Boise State and Kentucky because they have built out robust esports programs, uh, which is a crazy thing to hear. Uh, but it is happening, and we are very fortunate um, to be there uh, first. I mean, we 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 we're going on three years now, and it, it's been a it's been a great experience. Yeah, I've never been as good in the sticks as some of my friends, so that was <laughs> path for me. But you like do always hear about it as you know the next burgeoning thing in media yeah. and, and in, in sports. And you got to link up with my guy, uh, Kenny Bell here at, at Big Ten Network because he's an I, I know guy. Kenny. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I'm on green as well. You know, you got the, the Nebraska yeah. connection there. So you guys. You know what? There. I'm glad you brought that up. I've golfed with Kenny multiple times. We have a mutual friend um, in Colorado where Kenny is, is, is of course, from. Uh, we, we, we have a mutual friend out there and we've golfed often, but we yet have some now not cross have yet. Uh, somehow yet not cross paths that's a terrible sentence uh <laughs> got it out in 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 the big 10 circles but we have golf we've hung out in colorado for some reason we haven't met in, in chicago somehow <laughs> yeah working on a golf theme show with kenny bell right now we've been filming good so we'll that see. guy can play he can that play, can yeah. play. Yeah. yeah yeah he, he can uh, very multi-talented but uh yeah. all right back to some of the the btn folks you have worked with you're doing the tailgate show with uh annie sabo on campus and when this opportunity like got in front of you on your desk how did you how was it kind of pitched to you did you know right away that it was a, a good experience because they've they've switched the show up a lot yeah. from what it used to be it used to be Dave Jerry and Howard on campus mm -hmm. now uh different look different feel so how was it presented to you guys uh well of of course even after leaving Minnesota I, I watched the Big Ten Network because I like Big Ten football so I was very familiar with the show and I had met Quentin three years ago, something like that. I was in Chicago. He gave me a tour of the studio and everything. And it, it's so strange how these things work because three years go by, you know, email exchange here, and there, but all of a sudden the phone rings and it's, Hey, uh, myself and our producer of the show, we're going to hop on a zoom and let's see how this works out. It was semi-casual, semi-interview based, uh, they threw some stuff at me and then it was kind of dead for a little bit. And funny enough, I flew to Colorado where my family lives, was driving to the golf course, of course, uh, with my brother and his wife and the phone rings and it was Quentin. And he said, hey, this is the thing. Uh, if you want to do it, you should do it. And that's honestly how it it happened. It just all happened so quickly. 
Uh, and then before you know it, we're at Iowa for week one, uh, a big game, a great audience. And it, it, it's just so unreal that we are well over halfway at this point. I think we only have five weeks left, but it, it has been such a blur. I honestly don't think I'll be able to really realize how great this has been until the season's over. Yeah. Week nine already. I think you guys are going out to college part DMV yep. this weekend. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm going to run through it and, you know, it's putting you on the spot a little bit, but I love saw it. You had saw you had some, uh, some food on set at Wisconsin. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you some categories see if you can rattle off some of the, the more memorable experiences you've had. So what is okay. the best, the best food you've had, whether it is on set or like just mm-hmm. on campus going to dinner the night before, whatever it might be. Madison, Wisconsin, the old fashioned, uh, they had cheese curds and fried turkey legs for like 15 bucks or something like that. Uh, nat- nat- naturally, a lot of our crew is from the Midwest. Everybody there was saying, you have to go to this place. I went there. Best meal I've had so far. I've been there. It's really good. And I'm actually, oh, so I'll be there on Saturday. So maybe I'll. Oh, there you go. Swing Thank by you. there. You got to. reminder. All right. <laughs> Next category. What is, what's the best uh, like prop or guest? Could be a person. I know I saw you had some livestock on there once, I think. Yeah. <laughs> What's the That's best exactly thing what it was. Set? Yeah. Buttons. Buttons is uh, the trainer of the Rutgers horse. And no, it's not a fake horse in like a big foam suit. It is a real live horse that is massive. And we got to interview Buttons. And, you know, I, I know nothing about horses. I like animals. But just hearing him talk about the complexities of, of raising it and, and, and training it. I mean, it, it's a lot like ho- horses are skittish creatures by nature. So for him to train it, to not run away when a cannon goes off, cause they have a live cannon uh, just hearing him dive into that was, was awesome. Yeah. That was a, a hit. I remember uh, internally yeah. as well. Um, all right. What is the best backdrop like the best setting that you've had? And if, if you don't, if you don't say the one that I'm wanting you to say, <laughs> I will be upset. I will say this. So you, you, okay. Do you mean as far as campus or crowd or a combination? So I'm going to, I'm going to say just like the way the shot is framed. Oh, way, okay. 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 Yeah. And we'll get to crowd after that. Oh, there's some really, really, really good ones, man. Our, our cinematography, if that's the right term has been fantastic. Oh God. I hate this question. I, okay. Uh, I, I selfishly loved Penn State. I I did love Penn State. I hope that's the right answer that you were looking for. So I went to Illinois and I teed it oh, up. Oh, okay. In the background. Oh, that was just, no, 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 that was no, 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 no. Erase what I just said. Erase what I just said. Illinois, no question. That that was beautiful. Right there on Red Red Range Square, it was called, right? Grove, Grange Grove, yeah. Grange Grove. That was beautiful. Silly on me to forget that. Yes bar none illinois i even had had comments from buddies saying yo how how long did it take to like frame that and everything that looked great it, it, it looked cinematic there it really did yeah i selfishly slipped that in just because <laughs> up until this week we hadn't had a lot to be proud of this year the, the nine ot's baby nine ot's absolutely and um penn state you're right though is definitely my favorite like scenic we'll call it game. a 1a 1b all right we'll do that um the last one uh what's the best crowd you've had so far like most energy Michigan State was leading the way, and then Rutgers took it from them. But this recent week, Purdue just took the crown. And I love that because they're much more known for their basketball presence as far as the rowdiness of the crowd. They, they, they brought it, man. And it wasn't Wisconsin fans also mixed in with the Purdue crowd. There, there were Wisconsin people there, but it was all Purdue. They were excited coming off uh, the upset over Iowa. The game didn't go the way that they wanted, but that that energy a, a couple mornings ago was unreal. All right, where's somewhere you haven't been yet that you're looking forward to getting to? Minnesota, of course. Uh, I, I, I I can't wait to get there, especially the way that they're playing now. I'm expecting a very, very uh, – great atmosphere coming down the stretch if they can keep this up they're, they're going to have an interesting showdown up with iowa wisconsin at the end of the year yeah I'm, I'm glad you brought that up we'll get into some football stuff for sure because we got to prep you for the the show this weekend you know you get uh-huh. a little get some uh batting practice swings in here yeah uh, all right so we'll talk about the gophers in a minute but we got a big weekend obviously ahead um which undefeated big 10 team do you think is in the most trouble this weekend so we got michigan going against michigan state obviously mm-hmm. Then Ohio State is going to face that reeling Penn State team. So do you think mm-hmm. OSU, Michigan, or Michigan State has the most Michigan's worried? in trouble. I will always judge a team 
by who can make a big play downfield in a short amount of time, right? How Michigan is playing football. Again, it, it caught everybody off guard. Nobody thought they were going to come out here and turn into 2010 Wisconsin, right? Uh, and it's great. The only thing is, and it's, the, uh, of course, they're far from undefeated, but the same problem that Wisconsin has right now is if you are ahead of the clock, if you're winning the time of possession and you're ahead on the scoreboard, you can win games that way, right? But it's the Big Ten, and that's that's not always going to be the case. So I'm always going to lean to the side of the team who can strike big um, in a short amount of time, right? Peyton Thorne drops back and chucks that thing up to, to Naylor or Reed from 80 yards out. And they just go get it. Their, their explosive playability is incredible. Michigan can can pound the rock and get four yards, five yards, six yards, and that does wear you down. But if you're down 10 points with seven minutes left, Michigan's in a tough spot because it's going to take seven minutes to drive down. Now you have to get an onside kick. If you're Wisconsin, you're still struggling to throw the ball. You're in a tough spot. Michigan State may not be the most consistent team, but in those situations, I will side with the team that can, you know what, let's just chuck this up to Jaden Reed and see what happens. And more often than not, he comes down with it. Boom. Now we're only down three and there's still seven minutes left. Yeah, that'll be a good one to watch this weekend. And I'm glad you you brought up Minnesota because they are playing much better. What are your, what's your take on just how they've kind of turned the season around? They had that ugly one, the Bowling Green, and now have won three straight. Uh, how are we feeling in the Twin Cities? The Bowling Green loss will be the thorn in their side. If they don't lose to Bowling Green, they're ranked probably in the teens right now, which is frustrating, but you got to put it behind you. That loss is clouding what the Minnesota story should be. Right now, it's a team that played well against Ohio State, fell flat against Bowling Green, and got pushed to the back when really the story should be this team lost two of their top running backs and it is next man up, and whoever stands back there week to week is going for 100 yards. The O-line is playing incredibly. Tanner Morgan looks more comfortable. They are so banged up offensively, and to still be sitting in the situation that they're at is incredible. It is just unfortunate that that Bowling Green loss will be the cloud over them unless they uh, – un until they play Iowa uh, – they're 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 just being pushed to the back of of the Big Ten narrative, but that that's what happens when 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 you lose to schools that that you should beat. All right, so you mentioned that the Wisconsin game is going to be big this year. It's always uh, for the axe at the end of the year. Yeah. Can you explain that rivalry for like those of us? Who, yeah, <laughs> and, like, you know, all the other rivalries get more attention. I feel like na uh, nationwide, the national mm -hmm. audience. So, mm -hmm. uh, what's the deal with Minnesota Wisconsin? It, it is it is a unique one in that. I feel less less hatred there, right? So I, I'm born and raised in California. I go to Minnesota. So the rivalries are something that are new to me, right? I, I know the USC, UCLA. I know Oregon State, Oregon, right? Because I'm a West Coast kid. So it, it was interesting having an outsider's perspective. How I would explain it is Minnesota versus Iowa is a hatred thing. It's angry. There's a little more action at the bottom of the piles, a little more talking back and forth. Minnesota, Wisconsin is interesting because a lot of Minnesota's campus is Wisconsin kids. A lot of Wisconsin campus is, is Minnesota kids. And if you look on the rosters, a lot of kids are from the opposite state. So it, it's not a hatred, but it is the bragging rights thing. And once you get on that field and you see the axe and you, you see – six-year-olds screaming their head off as if they've hated Wisconsin their whole life and you see 80-year-olds who have hated Wisconsin their whole life it's just such a unique experience I mean it's it's the oldest rivalry I think in, in anything right now and you look at the axe and it goes all the way back to God knows when it, it, it's it's just such a great atmosphere all right so obviously the uh the playing days are, are well over mm -hmm. but when you reflect and you tell stories, you know, back at the, at the reunions with, with your former guys, yeah. what are the memories that you reflect on the most? Like, are there a couple that stand out uh, in the forefront of your mind? Definitely. There was such a unique, uh, and I, I'm sure every player feels this way, but you know, it, it's, it's funny how you, you go to Michigan and you play in front of 110,000 people or whatever the heck the capacity is there. Uh, or you have a triple overtime thriller on the road against this team, um, or you have a snow game and it's crazy, or you upset this ranked team. But honestly, it's just the random stories in the locker room. When 
we're playing basketball after workouts and our coach scored on one of our guys one-on-one or when somebody just said a dumb joke that isn't even funny in retrospect, but the timing was right. You know, it's, it's, it's the locker room and it's hanging around the, the uh, dorms, as they say, the whole Minnesota nice thing, it is incredibly true. And the rare, the unique thing that Minnesota has is when you're on campus, it feels like college, of course, but it's in the middle of downtown. I mean, we, we walked to Vikings games, you know, so that, that uniqueness of it, of finishing up film on Sunday, going to grab something to eat at the local spot. And then, Hey, let's, the, the Packers are in town. Let's just go walk to watch the game. That that is something unique to Minnesota that I don't think many other schools in the country can replicate. Yeah. I was actually there a couple weeks ago for the Nebraska game. And, you know, I've been there plenty of times, but I'd never been on a game day. And it was popping off. I know it was, uh, you know, it was a nice day and a big yeah. opponent with Nebraska fans there. Right. But I feel like Minnesota might not get the credit it deserves as like a game day town. That was that was a good time. I will tell you what. I, of course, throughout my time, my 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 brother would come visit on bye weeks. My cousins would come visit. My friends from back home would come visit. Nobody ever visited just once. They thought they were only going to visit once. My brother came about six or seven times. He, people thought he went there by the end of it. Yeah, I don't blame him. And, you know, you mentioned your brother. I uh, remember him from the Patriots, Shane. You were on the Bears like we talked about at the top. Uh, so I have to ask, you know, as a Bears fan myself and somebody who who goes through the weekly roller coaster uh, of, you know, maybe they're, they're back, maybe they're, they're yeah. developing Justin Fields. How do you, like, follow it as a former Bear? Like, are you connected to it? I know some people more than others, depending on how their careers went. Well, what's just kind of your lasting connection to the Bears and, and what do you think of what's going on now? The, the majority of my friends who still play are on other teams because that's just how the league goes. You know, there's like three people who are going to retire on the team they started with. The connection right now I have, with, or if, if, if I were to speak peace of mind to Bears fans right now, is take your time. It's Aaron Rodgers' division until he leaves. It is what it is. Now, granted, he may be leaving next year. I personally think he's, he's, he, he's gone. But have peace of mind over this year. You weren't beating him this year anyway. This guy's on a path of anger, and he wants to prove something to his GM. He, they have Team of Destiny written all over them. Just let it go. The problem is it's tough to develop Justin Fields when he's running for his life every play. I've never been an NFL GM. I don't know how to build a team. But we do see a trend from Miami to New York, both New Yorks, honestly, uh, to Chicago, to Jacksonville. What is the point of bringing in a generational talent at quarterback if he's running for his life every play, right? If you look at young quarterbacks who've succeeded, they have protection or they have elite threats around them to where they don't need the protection, right? Allen Robinson is an elite talent, but if he does, if it feels does not have time to throw him the ball, what is the point of that? You know, we get so caught up in, and well, they'll figure it out. No, they're, they're not going to figure it out because they don't have time to figure it out. Um, I, I, again, I'm not saying being a GM is an easy job, but I will say, look at all the young talents right now in this league and they're not developing. How can you develop when you're on the ground all game long? Um, I, I hope it is, I hope there is a change in mindset in the development of franchises soon Get that alignment in the first round. Get that alignment in the second round. Do what you got to do this week. Sign a Fitzpatrick or a Flacco while you build up that O-line. Uh, and then you bring in your young quarterback who can get some confidence and succeed. Well, you said it there with your first point. Like, I, I'm well aware Aaron Rodgers is my my father, my football yeah. father. <laughs> Nothing I can do. I'm hoping, it's, I'm hoping it's the last dance and that, you know, he's on his way out. This is another NFC championship game. Like, <laughs> um, all right, Rock, it's been a lot of fun, man. I know you got to go. I had one more question though. Uh, please, please, please. Let's go. Uh, I saw you tweeting about succession. I'm a fan. Oh, I just, oh, come it on. It is back. Yeah. Do you have any theories? No spoiler. Like we can, you know, if anyone's in the middle of watching, they can hop well, off. Well, right here's, here, here's, no here's the thing. What are your theories? So th- this is spoiler free, but it's still a fact. And me and my girlfriend talk about it all the time. Greg the Egg is playing everyone. Hear me now, believe me later. Greg the Egg ends this thing at the top, whether intentionally or by accident, still deciding. His grandpa, 
is the most powerful person on this show. Yes, Logan Roy is CEO, chairman, whatever, but his grandpa hates Logan so much he is willing to do anything to bring him down. Greg the Egg is the only person who is not hated by anybody and is not loved by anybody. Greg finds himself, go, go back into the most important scenes over the two and a quarter seasons. He's always there. Greg is always there in the room when something crazy happens. You don't think about him there because he's Greg, but he knows, okay, I don't want to get into it because this is spoiler proof, but he knows where all the bodies are buried and he knows all the secrets. Nobody else realizes it because he's an afterthought. Greg is at the center of all of this. And I'm telling you now in four years, however many years this show goes, you're going to want to cut this clip and post it because I'm calling him. Love that theory. Uh, I think I love cousin Greg, just like everyone else does. And I, I read an article about, uh, or the interviewed Logan, the actor, and he was mm. saying, I think it's got one or two more seasons left. He said after this one. So, and, 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 and you know what? I, I love that. The same thing with breaking bad. Mm. Um, Hey man, if, if the story is five seasons, just cut it at five seasons. Don't go walking dead where you go from everyone's favorite show to what the heck is even going on. You have like Dexter. two of the same characters who were who you were like, like there's only two characters left that you can even recognize if you started from season one and, and you just fall off have a set amount of seasons when it's run its course get out of there uh so that i i had not seen that but that gets me excited that they're not going to milk this thing forever I agree with that and we started as a you know big time football <laughs> we, we on succession. <laughs> mission, fan fiction all that good stuff yeah. uh brock Appreciate it, man. Looking forward to uh, linking up with you down the road at some point in person. Of course, man. And we will see you on Big Ten Tailgate this weekend and the rest of the way. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me, man. Um, again, check out Tailgate. Uh, ESTV, if you are an esports fan or if you are just curious about esports, again, ESTV on all of your OTT platforms, Roku, Sling TV, all of those, Samsung TV Plus. And Alex, anytime you want me on here, man, let me know. We can talk football, we can talk basketball, we can talk succession, whatever you want, man. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks once again to Brock for jumping on. Great to meet him, get to know him a little bit. I'm sure this will not be the last time he contributes in a uh, either t podcast format or digital format for us. He's already killing it on the TV side, as we mentioned, for the Big Ten Tailgate show. And continue to follow his work and um, you know, get to know him as he builds his career. So great to talk to Brock Farine. All right, kicking it over now to Harold Shelton, our Big Ten Network Manager of Research. Harold is a regular guest on the show pretty much every week as we break down what's going on in Big Ten football, we'll get into Big Ten basketball as well when that season gets up and running. But right now, it is the, uh, the thick of Big Ten football with some massive games this weekend. It's pretty much the biggest spotlight we're going to have this season on one single weekend with a bunch of implications coming out of the Michigan-Michigan State game, Ohio State-Penn State game, and a handful of other games sprinkled across the conference as well. So talk to Harold about what it means, especially with those two big-time matchups coming up, uh, the big noon game uh, with Michigan and Michigan State, and a very important game for Ohio State and Penn State as well, especially on the, the Buckeye side, as they are still well in the running for a college football playoff spot. So great stuff from Harold coming up, especially from his perspective as a Michigan State grad. He always uh, injects a little bit of that fandom into it but not in a biased way so uh enjoy getting his perspective especially when michigan state's involved in the big game coming up so we'll toss it over right now to harold shelton and get his perspective as guy behind the numbers and uh, the manager of research ahead of this weekend all right very pleased to be rejoined by big 10 network manager of research harold shelton h we said we had to do a podcast this week for weeks because we saw the schedule was lining up to have a big october 30th we're here. How you feeling? I feel good. Um, I would have felt a lot better if we had two top 10 matchups. I know your guy, I know you don't care about that at all. Your guys went out and got a big win. Uh, shout out to them. Um, so instead of having two top 10 matchups, we got two top 20 matchups. Uh, not quite as fun, but still a huge week. Hey, look at my polo. People on YouTube watching it says B1G. I'm a company man. You know, I want what's best for the league, but uh, yeah, we'll get into the upset here in a little bit uh, with Illinois taking down Penn State and kind of ruining uh, plans from not only, you know, 
the top 10 matchup perspective, but some, I think some college game day, uh, you know, the, the show that must not be named on these airwaves, uh, plans, but we'll get into it, um, for sure. And, and the big matchups that are coming up this weekend, we're getting down the stretch here. Uh, but first let's, let's take it to what we kind of always do before, uh, we get into the nitty gritty and that's evaluate the, the guests that we have on ahead of you here on the show. We had Brock Vereen. It's my first time meeting him, or uh, one of our newer employees here at Big Ten Network. Super nice guy and uh, smart, insightful guy. And want to know what you remember about Brock from his Minnesota playing days in the early 2000 teens, as we'll call it. Yeah, I remember him as a. He was a, he was a playmaker for sure, uh, especially his last year. I know he was all uh, Big Ten guy, first team guy in 2013, which was my first year at the network. And you know. He was kind of a, a tone setter for those Jerry Kill teams. Um, you know, they kind of play similarly to what they do now, just in terms of, you know, run the football, shorten the game, play good defense, have good guys in the secondary that can make plays. And, you know, I wouldn't say he was like the Antoine Winfield of that defense, but he was certainly a playmaker and, uh, you know, parlayed that into uh, being in the NFL for a while. I'm glad Minnesota had that 2019 year to kind of cap off the decade, right? Because a lot of programs, I think, around the country uh, would take and trade places of what Minnesota had. Like, they have been a sneaky, successful program nationally as far as getting to bowl games, you know, getting six-plus wins. And But a lot of the times they won't get recognized unless you have kind of a capstone season like they had when they beat Penn State 2019, made a, a New Year's uh, bowl game, and, you know, really kind of, like I said, put the cap on the decade and – made it an overall really solid sneaky decade, I think, for that program. Yeah, absolutely. And I know there was another year uh, that the year is escaping me now, but I remember we sent a, a crew to Madison for Minnesota, Wisconsin, last game of the year, winner wins the West. And I remember absolutely freezing on the sideline um, at the game. And Minnesota had a lead most of the way, and Wisconsin kind of came back and beat them late. But you know, 2019 wasn't the only year that Minnesota was competitive and had a chance to break through and get the Indy. Um, so, yeah, they've, they've done a really good job. Like you said, it's been under the radar, but, you know, they get to the postseason. They've won big games. Uh, you know, they did it with Kill. They did it with Clays. And obviously, PJ's done it, too. So, yeah, they've definitely done a, a really good job. And it's still under the radar. And it's crazy now. You, you look at them and, you know, they're five and two and then first in the West and, you know, people kind of left them for dead after the Bowling Green loss, and here they are. Yeah, I was telling Brock that um, the game day atmosphere there, I think, is better than a lot of people might expect, you know, especially not being a traditional college town, uh, especially not being a traditional powerhouse as far as college football programs go. But it matters, I think, stacking up those bowl seasons, stacking up, you know, winning seasons, and especially when the project we went there for a couple weeks ago was based mostly around tailgating and, and trying to, create content around the tailgating scene with Kenny Bell. Like we didn't know what to expect, but it was, it was awesome. Like they had a really, really good setup there, really engaged fan base. It was a morning game and they still had a ton of people out there. And then after the game, the streets were, were really festive. So I think that just, you know, goes to show if you can stack seasons where you are competitive, the institutional vibe of game day just elevates itself. I've been to other campuses where it's not like that. And there's just not really an expectation that you're going to wake up early on game day and get out there. Um, so, uh, you know, Minnesota fans, I think should be, you know, grateful, not, not grateful necessarily, but just appreciate that, that they do have a college football vibe there when it's not like that everywhere in college football. Yeah, I agree. And I think it also helps to have an identity. You kind of know what to expect from your team. And if you know they're going to go out and they're going to play hard, even if they're limited in some areas, you know, more often than not, they're going to be in every game. Like you're not expecting them to go and, and get run off the field. Um, you know, I wasn't at the game, obviously, but the opener against Ohio State, I mean, that place was electric and you could see it on TV. You could hear the noise. And, you know, they were in that game for, you know, three plus quarters before the Ohio State talent just kind of got away from them. But you know, when you're a team like that, you know, you in the way they play, you're in every game and it gives you even more incentive to go out and support. Yeah. And as a sports fan, I hate when people tell me what I should be happy with or, you know, if I should be uh, if I should accept what, you know, a certain team of mine is giving me or whatever. So it's not like that I'm coming at it from that angle. It's more of just like as an outsider, not being familiar with with how things operate. Like I was impressed is what I'm trying to say. Um, but anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about Minnesota. 
going forward uh, as we get into the next weekend's games, because Minnesota is a factor now, um, you know, as far as getting to a bowl game and having a nice season. But let's look back before we look too far forward and bring up that game you talked about at the top, Illinois, Penn State, uh, really throwing a wrench in things as far as potential playoff picture goes, pretty much taking Penn State out of the running there. And uh, let's be honest, watering down the matchup a little bit against Ohio State. So first reactions, Harold, did you see it coming? Because I certainly did not when I flipped on ABC at 11 a.m. on Saturday. No, I didn't see that one coming. And I know we had talked, uh, you know, off air about Iowa Purdue and how I wasn't too surprised by that one. I was definitely surprised by this one. Um, I thought it might be closer if Sean Clifford didn't play, you know, just kind of the way that Taquan Roberson looked against Iowa. I was wondering if, you know, assume I assumed he was going to play. And the game plan would have to look a little different and they would, you know, try to find a way to win, but, you know, certainly wouldn't be the, the 20 plus or 30 plus point win that everybody was expecting. And then once Clifford played and they got out fast, they said, okay, well, looks like they're going to be fine. And then, you know, I was kind of watching Michigan Northwestern for a while and I see both of these games are really close to half. Michigan starts to pull away. I noticed Illinois still hanging around. I'm like, hmm, what's going on here? And, you know, I mean, kudos to, to Illinois. I mean, the fact that they were able to just line up and run the football right at Penn State over and over and over again. And on the other side, completely take away the run game and get after Sean Clifford and make sure those uh, receivers of theirs couldn't get open. You know, they didn't have enough time to to get the matchups they wanted because Sean Clifford was under duress the whole time. So, you know, it was kind of interesting seeing how, you know, a lot of people, you know, myself included, kind of thought they'd be the most thrown his team under the bus. And you kind of wonder why that was happening. And clearly it galvanized them. And, you know, they didn't listen to the outside noise and they went out and, and got a huge win. Yeah, I was very surprised at how helpless Penn State looked when they were trying to stop the run. But also, I think we gloss over the fact a little bit that Chase Brown missed some important games. Illinois. I think he missed the Purdue game and, and the Maryland game as well, I want to say. Um, and, you know, you, you flip some of those close results and Illinois could have a good record if they hadn't thrown away some of those games at the end there. And who knows, maybe they don't get inspired, motivated to win a game like this if they don't take some lumps early on. So it's hard to say, but Chase Brown is such a huge, huge factor for them in the run game. It allows them to have a pass game that is really limited because they, they, they can lean on those running backs with, with him and McCray. Um, and I just thought it was interesting, you know, this is one of those weeks where I really got annoyed with like college football Twitter. And I always bemoan a lot of, you know, the, the narratives that get going on, on in and around college football media. Like that's one of my favorite things to complain about on the podcast, but this week I was just really annoyed in general, just, I think because of the, how sour the dialogue around Bielema got, like, it seemed like people just ran with the narrative that, you know, you use the term throwing him under the bus. And like, I see how that could be taken from the clip that was out there and went viral. Like, that's absolutely what it sounded like. But I think when you look deeper into what he was talking about, as far as answering a specific question from that clip, um, you know, it might be able to, the comments might be taken a different way, like how he, he clarified it. And look, I see how, you know, if the result had gone differently Saturday, you could look at those comments and say, you shouldn't have said anything regardless, but clearly, like you said, it galvanized him. And I just was surprised at, at the amount of people who took an easy opportunity to maybe kick a guy or a program while they're at the bottom of a rebuild. You know what I mean? Like it's an easy target then, but then when he comes around and wins a game like this, you kind of got to give the guy credit. And so I enjoyed that, that, that he was able to win a signature game after a week of getting beat up and in the media. And that was half of what annoyed me. And the other half was, on Saturday, when those overtimes were playing out, instead of just like watching and appreciating a, a, another weird college football uh, happenstance or occurrence where they're trying out this rule for the new, the first time. And look, I don't like the rule. I don't think the two point conversion is uh, a compelling TV, a compelling way to decide a game. I don't like penalty kicks or penalty shots and other sports to decide games, but everyone also just piled on that saying how bad a football was instead of saying, Oh, maybe this is, you know, good defense that we're seeing in crunch time here and and kind of diminishing the the win, I thought, in some respects, as a, as opposed to just giving 
Illinois and Bielema the credit. So I realize I'm coming off as just like a chip on the shoulder type of follower of a program. We all, we all know there's fans out there like that, but it was just another example of everyone just being so cynical on Twitter all week. And, and uh, I think it's, you know, a week where Illinois fans should feel good overall. And, and I think they deserve a pat on the back from the, the nationwide college football media. Well, Illinois definitely deserves a pat on the back. And I think for the most part they did. Um, I think for me, just watching it, um, the fact that there were no conversions at all from OT three to OT seven, and it's just literally three yards, just get three yards, however yeah. you get it. I think it was more of that, like Penn State runs a trick play and Sean Clifford drops it. Or like, you know, there's a guy wide open and they miss him. Like it was that kind of stuff mixed in with, you know, some some pretty good defense where like, you know, Penn State tried to run it in, Illinois stopped them. You know, uh, Illinois tried to run it in, Penn State stopped them. Like stuff like that, like I think is good defense. And I think if that was mixed in where, okay, Sean Clifford catches that one and then Illinois converts and then you get somewhere, you know, let's say each team converts two of them, then I don't think it's looked at nearly as bad, but it literally is like, okay, you didn't get convert, you didn't convert. Okay, now we're gonna go to the other end zone, and it's gonna take two or three minutes. That was and dumb. We Walking back thing. and forth was like yeah, that's yeah. that that doesn't need to happen either. Yeah, I agree. It was not the most you know pleasant viewing experience, but like I feel like when other things happen in college football that are just bizarre or that are uh, consistent with a pattern of play, like the inability to convert, like we saw. I would flip that around and point to what we see in the Red River shootout every year where there's no defense and teams just oh, it's, last, it's last possession wins. And everyone's like, oh, my God, this is so exciting. This is, you know, this is college football at its best. I'm like, there's no defense being played. Like, you can enjoy that. But on the flip side, there was good goal line defense being played, even though there were some drops and, and you know, some some blunders toward the end of that game. It's just like I, I don't know why people are so angry all the time, especially on college football Twitter. It's like the pitchforks get out and and this is why i need to, to log off once in a while and not pay such close attention to, to what the horde is saying yeah i think this for the way i took it at least was you have these teams and they play nine overtimes and they combine for 38 points and you're like okay like what, what's the deal here like you you're playing you know it's 165 plays and you guys got 38 points like what's the deal here um i think for me the biggest takeaway was Usually when a team like Illinois is playing a team like Penn State and the, the number is as big as it is, the, you're just kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop for the underdog. And like eventually, mm -hmm. like they're, you know, the way they play and all that, it, it won't matter. And like the better team usually wins kind of thing. And it never happened. And right. so like I kept waiting for, OK, well, now Penn State is going to make a play and then Illinois would stop them. Or like, OK, now Penn State is going to make a play and then Illinois would stop them. And so like. No, there was a couple of times. I want to say uh, Brisker had a chance for a pick. I think it was in the second overtime and he dropped it. Up. Yeah, so yeah. many interceptions. Right. Yeah. So, like, I kept waiting for Penn State to make that play, and they never did. And kind of like kudos Purdue, to Illinois for – Purdue-Iowa game, right? Yeah. Like you kind of expected Iowa to wake up, and it just never happened. Right. So, and I mean, again, Illinois completely controlled the game. You know, they ran for 357 yards against a good defense. You know, controlled the ball for over 36 minutes. Clifford had no time to throw despite all those great receivers. And, I mean, I definitely saw it as Illinois won the game more than Penn State lost it. All right, so is there any way Penn State recovers then um, going into Ohio State? Who is rolling? You know, we talked about it a lot on this show that, like, we neither of us believe that Ohio State was really dead or anything like that. They straightened out some of their issues, and now they're scoring a bunch of points. Um, what are we thinking now that the matchup has a little less sizzle going into it? Uh, probably the worst possible time to play them, I would think. Um, we still don't really know how healthy Clifford is. And I know Franklin said in his presser that, you know, he's as close to 100% as he's been. And, you know, I'm not really sure how that's possible, but, you know, obviously I'll take his word for it. Um, so, I mean, that that's fine. And if that's the case, then he's going to have to make plays downfield. And I don't know if he's going to have the time to do that. If he didn't have the time against Illinois, you kind of wonder how you'll get the time against Ohio State. Um, it's just kind of weird, like in his in his past where they lose one game and it immediately snowballs into another one. And I think it's like the fourth time in the last five years that's happened, where as soon as they suffer their first loss, like they don't get off the mat right away. Like they suffer another one and then – you know, kind of get it back. 
you know, kind of going back to 2017 when they were second in the country and then lost to Ohio State and immediately lost to Michigan State the following week. Like, they, they kind of have this pattern of doing that. And now you're playing probably the best team in the Big Ten on the road with, you know, all of the rumors circulating and, you know, the, the news about James Franklin's agent, you know, being, you know, uh, apparently it was announced in the summer or it happened in the summer, but it was announced earlier this week that he changed agents and you got the whole LSU USC rumor stuff going on. It's just a lot going on around that program right now. And just seems like the worst possible time to be playing Ohio State. Yeah. And I don't know. I just have a sense. And even though this is just all voodoo and doesn't mean anything, like this is the kind of the time of year where weird stuff has been happening, right? Like Illinois seemed like it was the worst time possibly going to Penn State. Purdue uh, was not expected to be Iowa. It seemed like Iowa was on a, a steamroll course, you know, to the Big Ten championship game. So who knows? Like, I just wouldn't be shocked if Penn State either, you know, makes it real tight or, or wins. Uh, however, Ohio State is scoring 49 points a game. I saw that's like 12 points better than the second best. We would believe it's Michigan, the Big Ten. Um, can Ohio State's offense be slowed down or do you think Stratus figured it out? enough where they're kind of just a wagon now that uh will we'll roll you know to Indy and beyond so yeah that's the thing like how do you define slowing down do you, if you hold them to 40 I mean technically you're mm -hmm. slowing them down but like is that enough for a team to win um you know I think Penn State's defense I think their back seven is really good um I think PJ Mustafa for being out up front really hurts them and I think you saw that against Illinois but you know if the, the way those receivers are playing and the way Stroud is playing. I mean, he's been throwing dimes right and left and, you know, they seem to be getting better and better. I feel like you have to kind of win a shootout with them unless you're playing keep away and Penn State doesn't do a good job of playing keep away. Their main thing is, you know, hitting Dotson and Washington and Keandre Lambert Smith downfield and because they can't run the ball. So if you can't run the ball, you can't control the clock. So then it allows Ohio State's offense to get on the field. And I just it's, it just doesn't seem like a great matchup on paper for sure. All right. Well, we've seen how crazy that series has been uh, over time, especially the last five years or so. So yeah, uh, glad you mentioned that, too, because uh, I was just looking at it today. And, you know, since Franklin got there and they played four one possession games, you know, they're they've been the closest team to you know push Ohio State you know over these last seven or eight years and I know like there's been some one-offs for like Purdue one and Iowa one but just in terms of like consistently playing them every year Penn State's been the team that's pushed in the most of anybody else all right speaking of another dramatic series you know I'm surprised we got this deep into a podcast featuring you without getting into it but Michigan Michigan State uh this is this is one where I know you I'm sure Tense all week, waiting for it as a Sparty guy. Uh, Brock, earlier on the show today, said that he thinks Michigan's in trouble just because MSU's got that big play pop. What do you think? Are you nervous? Uh, what scares you about Michigan? And then looking at it from a clear-eyed statistical perspective, where do you think this game uh, – or how do you think this game shakes out? Uh, this, oh, I think we, we waited this long because Michigan State was on the bye, so we didn't have a chance to, to really – to bring them up and obviously Illinois was the, the huge story from last week but um I think for me just this game every year is always interesting it's always like an anxious feeling more so than like a nervousness um just because you know every year it's it's always the biggest game for Michigan State where it's not necessarily that way for Michigan um but I think it's it's a game where I think both teams are really similar in that you know they're both seven and oh and people thought that, you know, the Miami win was really good for Michigan State. Uh, I know De'Aaron King's been out. You know, he hasn't played since that game, so they've had some losses. And then we thought, you know, Michigan's win over Washington would be really good, and now we see Washington's not that good. So now there's the whole, well, who have they played? So they're both unproven. There's that thing. Then, you know, the common opponents, uh, they both beat Nebraska by three. You know, they both, you know, struggle for a while against Rutgers before pulling away. They both – know, beat Northwestern by 20. Like, there's a lot of similarities between the teams, but they kind of do it in different ways. As you said, Michigan State's more balanced. They hit big plays. Michigan's more of a ball control, run it at you, time of possession, and make sure they don't turn the ball over. So 
I think if Michigan, like if, if a team gets up by two scores, I think it's a problem either way. Because if, if Michigan gets up two scores, then they could do, you know, kind of let Aiden Hutchinson and David Ojabo go against an offensive line that's hadn't been so great the last couple of weeks uh, for Michigan State. And, you know, the way they run the ball and, you know, they get three and a half yards of carry and it keep moving the chains like they did against Northwestern, it's a problem. But Michigan State jumps out on top, you know, boom, boom, a couple of big plays to read or Walker breaks one or whatever. Now Michigan has to throw the ball and they don't want to do that. Okay, McNamara, good game manager, doesn't turn the ball over, but they don't really hit big plays in the passing game. Here and there they do, but most of their big plays come from Quorum and Haskins. So I think if a team gets up big early, I think the whoever is trailing has got big problems. All right, so we see the buzz building, right? Like that's part of this job is like seeing the venom on social media being ratcheted up this this year more than most because of this undefeated matchup is it's been a while since this has happened. Um, you know, the the D'Antonio is not there. And I feel like there were a lot of comments that were back and forth back at the time uh, when he was that we re- really would hype it up. I don't know if Tucker takes it to that level or not. Maybe after the game, we'll see him smoke a cigar or something. I love those pictures of him, uh, you know, smoking the other team pack or whatever you want to call it meme wise on on social media. Um, you know, there's been things in, said, obviously. There's been Devin Bush with the um, the field getting torn up at midfield. Um, all the little sibling comments in the past. Are you are you seeing anything that that might pop off in the game as far as like something unique to this rivalry or or uh, you know any any Donovan Peoples Jones doing the Paul Bunyan uh, pose in the end zone? What, what are you looking forward to as far as just the extracurriculars go in this one? I don't think you'll get anything from the coaches uh, before the game. I don't think there'll be any stoking of the flames there. They're both are very PC uh, when it comes to, you know, respecting the opponent and both teams have done a great job and both teams are very well coached, but I'm sure you're hearing all kind of, you know, F bombs and stuff in the locker room leading up to the game. Both guys are very intense. They know what the game is. They both have been in it. Um, Harbaugh as a player and a coach and, and Mel as a coach under Saban and then last year. So, you know, it, it's going to be intense. Um, it's by far the worst week for me on Twitter, just seeing the ridiculousness from both sides. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a toxic, <laughs> it's a pretty toxic environment for the week. And people who are usually mild mannered that I follow kind of go off the deep end a little bit this week. So it's kind of like, all right, let me, focus up more on my work and some other stuff and not try to, to read too much into it. But, uh, you know, I, I love Twitter, so I'm on it all the time. It's kind of hard to escape. But I wouldn't be shocked if we saw some extra curriculars from some players. Like I remember Jaden Reed doing the Paul Bunyan pose in the locker room with the trophy. And obviously you mentioned DPJ doing it after a long touchdown in 2018. And I don't know if they have a guy like Winovich who's going to, you know, have a, a crazy sound bite at the end of the game. Like, I know Hutchinson's emotional, but he's never really shown that um, that 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 kind of of speech. So uh, I'll be curious to see what happens uh, either way. Isn't it the worst when it's like your own fan base, like on Twitter, embarrassing you? Like you know, like that this is cringe, but it's your own fan base, so you like can't really say anything on either side. And I don't know. I've just experienced that a lot. I feel like um, you know diving into Twitter, and I I don't mix it up really at all anyway, just because. That would be unprofessional, but, um, you know, I feel like when things get intense like this and there's been a lot of social media, uh, tiffs, I feel like, you know, especially in the last year in basketball and football, there's always something with, with various fan bases, but it's really like when your own fan base does something cringy, I think that's the worst as far as like my own personal social media experience. Yeah, it is. And again, I know it's a, it's a vocal minority kind of deal. Like I know most of, you know, the, the Twitter for both sides isn't that bad, but that, that vocal minority gets really loud, like really loud. And, it, and I don't want to, and like, kind of like you were like, I try to be a professional. Like you guys know I'm a Michigan state guy, but I don't go too far. At least I don't feel like I go too far on social media saying this, that, and the other. And there's obviously times where I'll see stuff and I'm like, that couldn't be more wrong if you tried, but I'm not going to be the well actually guy. 
on Twitter either. So I just kind of have to bite my tongue and move on. And, you know, there's some comments both sides that, you know, I can laugh at or like, okay, that was pretty good. Or, you know, I see you, but there's way too many where I'm like, oof, that is, yeah, I'm going to just keep moving. Yeah. Every, and every fan base, you know, this is not unique to any rivalry or fan base. Like every fan base has uh, a minority on Twitter, a vocal minority that, that will get into trouble or, or say stupid stuff. Um, I think the best example, like not to rehash it too much, but uh, that talks about the schools we, we've just brought up here is when Illinois and Michigan fans were getting into all year on basketball about basketball last year. And then Michigan state got dragged in uh, when Iowa DeSumo got hurt. And then Illinois and Michigan state fans are going back and forth and Michigan fans were taking the side of Michigan state fans just because of the Twitter beef that was going on. So that was just like a, a hilarious piece of art almost online that, that highlighted the absurdity of some of the, uh, the rivalries that go on. Yeah. Now you call it, I'd seen Michigan fans come to the defense of Michigan state for like the first time in anything. It was really, really weird. Um, cause usually Illinois and Michigan state from my experience have had no issues. Yeah. Very friendly. Um, yeah. They've been very friendly. So, you know, to kind of see that happening, I was like, wait, what? Seriously. And then seeing like the defenders, I'm like, wait, you guys seriously. So it, it, it was, a, it's a lot of that. Like you said, the vocal minorities, you know, they drown out, you know, the silent majority more often than not. And uh, that's just the, the way Twitter is. Yeah. Anyone who's not on Twitter will have tuned this out long ago because we've gotten so deep into it. Um, but before we wrap up, H, let's get into a couple matchups that might catch your eye outside of those two headliners this weekend. Um, uh, Iowa, Wisconsin is one that has Big Ten West implications, especially after Iowa lost to Purdue. It looked like Iowa was going to have a, a clear path. Um, you know, Wisconsin is always a threat. It seems like in the Big Ten West to make it to Indy. Um, I'll be up there for that one. So what are you expecting as far as uh, Iowa getting back on track after the bye and Wisconsin you know, continuing to, to ground and pound and, and shut people down on defense and, and run the darn ball, as we say? Um, I'd be very surprised if either team gets to 20 points in this game. Um, I expect a lot of punts. I expect some turnovers on both sides. Um, you know, we'll see if this Wisconsin formula can work. I mean, the last, you know, two, three games has literally just been Malusi and, and Braylon Allen running the ball all over the place with a little bit of Graham Mertz on the ground mixed in. I mean, it seems like as long as they don't turn the ball over like they did against Notre Dame and, and Michigan, that they're going to be in every game just because that defense is so good, especially Leo Chanel. Um, I think for Iowa, it's, it's strange because, like you said, they, you know, we were talking about Iowa's the playoff team and Iowa's got this clear path in the West and then they lose a the game and then they go on a bye. And, like, they're still in the top 10 and they're an underdog this week at Wisconsin, who's unranked. And so, you know, it seems like every week I look up and Wisconsin's favorite, no matter what the record is. And I, I think it speaks to, you know, just the, the strength of their defense and, and the strength of their run game that they're going to be in every game. But I do think it's interesting that, um, you know, that I was an underdog in this game. But at the same time, I mean, before last year, Wisconsin owned the series. I mean, they were winning, you know, they were basically just a better version of Iowa in every game where the offense would do enough, the defense would shut it down. And they'd win by seven or 10 points every game and they move on. And now, you know, we kind of threw Wisconsin away after the Michigan loss. And you look and you're like, oh, man, they're a game back of Iowa and Minnesota. They play both of them. Their two losses are against East Division teams. So if they run it, they'll be back in Indy. And like you weren't expecting to see that when, you know, they were one and three. And now here they are and they got everything in front of them. Yeah, points at a premium on Saturday in Mad City. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a scene. I feel like everywhere across the Big Ten with Halloween weekend being mm -hmm. kind of the, the looming uh, backdrop of all this. It's just gonna be uh, gonna be fun. So <clears throat> before we go, uh, you brought up Minnesota, and they're kind of back in this like intriguing picture. And we talk about Big Ten football. They lost to Bowling Green, and everyone kind of wrote them off. Um, what are we thinking about the Gophers as they, you know, look to be, uh, in position for another win in a row here would be four in a row if they can handle business against Northwestern. Like, I, know, I know a lot of people don't like him. He might be polarizing, but PJ Fleck and coach, it is what it is. Like 
I know people might not like the road of boat stuff or wearing the tie, you know, on game day and him sprinting from one side to the other after the quarter, but that dude can coach. They win a bunch of one possession games. They clearly have a culture. I mean, they've got five running backs who run for 100 yards in a game this year. Like you lose Mo Ibrahim, you think, oh man, that's you know, that's going to be tough to replace. And then Trey Potts comes out, runs for 100 yards a couple of times. He goes out, oh man, they're down there, third and fourth and fifth running back. Bryce Williams comes out, big run against Nebraska. They win. You know, you get Marquise Irving, Ty, you know, Kai Thomas. They both go over 100 against Maryland. Like the way their system is set up, it just plug and play at running back. And it is pretty amazing. And Tanner Morgan starting to play a little better. Chris Ottman Bell being back certainly helps. He's clearly the big play guy for them uh, out wide. And that defense has been quietly really good all year. They're like fifth in the country in rush defense. And so, you know, it's kind of under the radar because of how they looked early against Ohio State and all that stuff. But they're five and two, like you said, a winnable game this week. And, you know, they can go into November, you know, like, look, we got it all in front of us. We got a chance to go to Indy if we just take care of our business because there doesn't look like a dominant team in this division. All right, H, any other notes or game matchup uh you know content you want to talk about we we're wrapping up here but if there's anything that catches your eye the rest of the weekend let me know before we before we bounce uh i mean i think if we want to just kind of go into the magnitude of the the michigan michigan state game uh you know the fact that it's the first time these teams are both seven or better when mm -hmm. they're facing each other uh, you know, first top 10 matchup since 1964 is for one is rare that they're playing this late in the season to begin with. And there's usually not like the stakes aren't like this. There's usually stakes for one team or the other, or like they might play when they're both four and oh or five and oh, or, you know, we've seen some top 15, top 20 type matchups between them, but we haven't seen it like this. And so I'm curious just to kind of see like the buzz of college football around this matchup is usually like oh yeah like i want to watch that matchup these two teams don't like each other there's always like some crazy stuff going on but like you know big noons there and like you said the game days there and you know everybody like the, the center of the college football world is in east lansing which is pretty crazy when you think about ohio state penn state and georgia florida also playing on the same day yeah it'll be it'll be wild for sure and last year you know michigan state beat michigan that was when I first, I think all of us kind of had an inkling that, oh, okay, uh, this might not be like a long-term rebuild type thing with Tucker, um, you know, and, and they're going to be a factor sooner than we think. And I'll still never forgive myself for missing the trouble with the snap play because I, I thought the game was over and I went outside, uh, and left the TV. But I don't know, maybe we'll be rewarded with some craziness this weekend. Although I don't think I can watch this weekend either because, like I said, I'll be at Wisconsin. So uh, I don't know, maybe I'll, on the radio on the way back home or something like that. We'll see. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be shocked if that game was a little over three hours. So, like, you might be able to watch uh, yeah. some fourth quarter action because I know Fox would get a lot of commercials in. And, uh, you know, I think if, if Michigan State is scoring some points, it's usually by throwing the ball. So you might get a few more stoppages. You might be able to catch, like, the last half of the fourth quarter. At someone's tailgate or something like that. We'll, we'll yeah, exactly. All right, H, uh, that's all I got this week. And you know, you know how much I enjoy talking basketball as well. But uh, we'll give it till next time since un exhibition season just getting underway. We'll have plenty to talk about uh, down the road and, and a, lot of, a lot of Big Ten basketball storylines ahead. But a lot to take care of on, on the football field first. So looking forward to that. And uh, let's get another shot of this weekend and, and have some fun on Saturday. Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, obviously, huge weekend. Um, even though it's not, it doesn't quite have the sizzle uh, as we thought it would, it's still going to be huge. All right. We'll talk soon, man. All right. Thanks again to Harold Brock for joining the show. Really good discussion this week and a, a pivotal week for Big Ten football. This is kind of one of those weeks that a lot of the season builds toward and we'll know a lot more on the other side of it. So really looking forward to uh, this weekend, like I touched on in the show with Brock and uh, Harold getting up to Wisconsin have not been to a game in Madison in quite a while so that will be fun uh, and then from there also keeping an eye on the other games that are going on that have some uh, major importance in the, the Big Ten football uh, not only championship game push in Indy but also the 
college football playoff picture and those rankings are coming out very soon as we get into November here as well. All right. Thanks to everyone for listening. If you are listening and have not subscribed yet on the major podcast platforms, we are out there on po- uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and you can watch these interviews as well on the Big Ten Network YouTube channel. There is a Take 10 podcast playlist and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And this will be really easy to find. You can see the guests doing their interviews here with me on the show. Uh, thanks again to Julie Bronder, who stitched the show together, produces it. And thanks again to everyone for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon on the other side of a huge week of Big Ten football here on the Take 10 Podcast.